Welcome to the Inclusive Growth Show with Toby Milden. Future-proofing your business by creating a diverse workplace. Hey there, thank you ever so much for tuning into this episode of the Inclusive Growth Podcast. I'm Toby Melden, and today we are rejoined by one of our fabulous guests who's been on the the show before, Rachel Edmondson-Clark. It's worth going back to a previous episode where Rachel joined me and we talked about inclusive leadership. But today we're going to be talking about burnout because burnout is a very important topic for our well-being. A lot of people working within the corporate sector, well, not just the corporate sector, is it? You know, it's any any workplace really are facing burnout on a regular basis. And the work that I do with diversity and inclusion leaders and practitioners in particular, you know, burnout comes up quite a lot where diversity and inclusion leaders or practitioners feel overwhelmed with the amount of work that they need to do. They've, they're not they're not given the resources to really do what they need to do within their organizations. It leads to a lot of frustration and a lot of burnout. And unfortunately, we do see a lot of diversity and inclusion leaders and practitioners changing jobs quite frequently and leaving their organizations because of the pressure they are under. So I'm really looking forward to catching up with Rachel and learning again from her today. So Rachel, lovely to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. It's wonderful to be here. I always enjoy our conversations, Toby. So thank you. Thanks. So um, before we sort of dive into the main questions, I know you've been on the podcast before, but could you just reintroduce yourself just in case the person listening to us today hasn't heard our previous episode together? Of course, of course. So I I help leaders to change behaviours for increased and sustainable high performance. I am healthily obsessed with my work and I have been for more than 20 years now. It's my soul's contract. I absolutely love what I do. And it manifests in a number of ways, whether that be consultancy, coaching, facilitating and also speaking. And I think it's probably also relevant for the audience today to uh, note that I'm also a certified health coach as well. So this is a topic I am very passionate about. Brilliant. Well, I've, we've got lots to learn from you, so I'm really excited to to dive into the questions. I mean, have you have you got any personal experience of burnout that you're happy to share with us? And and if you have, what what have you learned from that? Yeah, absolutely. There was one time, and um, I can I remember the specific afternoon, and it all hit me. So I was in my glass fronted office, I was preparing my things ready to go into the boardroom. And instead of walking out the door, I found myself lying on the floor, looking up at the ceiling tiles, because I'd collapsed. Mm. And I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't think and I couldn't breathe. And I later realised that I had absolutely hit that burnout wall. And it was what I'd been doing over a number of years, I'd I'd adopted habits that had left me depleted from working long hours, disappointed and annoyed at myself for not taking better care of my health. And I felt very guilty as well, because I was also neglecting the most important relationships in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was, I was was like the runaway bride, because this is a while ago now, um, before I was married and been married 10 years now. But we delayed our wedding first for six months and then for a year because of the work and the work pressure. And, you know, you were talking about it in your introduction there, you know, that is a, that there is a very real sense of the pressure and the workload that is on. Um, and thank goodness my gorgeous husband is patient with me, you know? Um, and that was, that was a long time ago now, but there's been times as well where I've come close, but never as bad as that again. And I guess I've learned a number of things along the way. Have, have you ever experienced anything similar, um, Toby? I've never ended up on the office floor. <laughs> that would involve falling out of my wheelchair, which would be quite <laughs> painful, actually. When I do look back at it, yeah, I think I've I've probably experienced milder forms of burnout. Um, even in my current role, I think I get close to it fairly frequently because I've got a really busy schedule lots of demands on my time. But one 
thing that I do is every two months I, I have a quiet week. It's not a holiday. I don't necessarily go anywhere, but it's just a week where I don't schedule meetings. And if I can go away, I might pop, you know, I might go away briefly or I might just stay at home and just potter around Manchester, go to art galleries, go out to coffee shops, that kind of thing. Just try to have a restful week. And that that's something that works quite well for me. What what were some of the habits that you mentioned that that led up to that that kind of burnout episode that you had? Disrespecting and a lot of things that uh, would sound maybe basic, um, but just working long hours, mm. um, working massively long hours. Sleep was a big one. Food as well. Mm. So I, I I frequently remember just walking around the office trying to shovel something in my mouth because I just didn't even have the time to sit down to be able to have a meal. Mm. You know, and as I said, you know, just neglecting the most important relationships in my life and, you know, not being close to people that we care about and who care about us, you know, that I think also has an impact and, um, in, in terms of how we feel. And it wasn't a sudden thing. It was something that came up, you know, over weeks and months and, you know, maybe even, you know, longer than that, that this was sort of slowly, slowly, slowly creeping, getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And I was ignoring it, ignoring it, ignoring it, continuing to try and push on through. And, you know, you'd say to yourself, you know, if I can just get through this, then it will be all right when. And Mm. constantly just desperately trying to stay on top of things, but never really feeling like you can come properly up for air. Yeah. And, um, you know, then ultimately it wasn't until my body then eventually just went, that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. Yeah. Like you, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I found myself on the office floor. I think you've got to, I think the things that I've learned and, and what's different now to where I was way back then was I'm so much more aware now. And mm. I recognize that things aren't right before I get anywhere near that level of burnout. And it's really interesting listening to what you're saying there about, you know, every every so often being able to take a week, a quieter week, because I think being able to regularly restore ourselves is so, so, so important. You know, burnout is this cumulative stress that hasn't been managed. And if it gets it, if it gets its hooks into you, it can be completely debilitating, which is what it ended up for, you know, for, for me. Uh, and if it does, if you're not taking steps, you know, like, like you are, Toby and like what you're describing there then you know it get it can get so debilitating that you know even even if you were to slow down or take a break or even a, a holiday that might not cure it because you're you know absolute exhaustion yeah and yeah. so i think being aware of those signs and working out what you need to do and we can talk a bit about that would be you know more than happy to talk about that so that things don't get really really bad so for yourself where where do you think those habits came from what do you think were the underlying beliefs that that kind of formed those habits yeah Uh, so they're beliefs that have probably been instilled in me from a very young age you know around uh hard work trying your best. I think I also felt a great deal of responsibility as well. I I cared deeply about my work as I do now. There were times when I, uh, when I, when I, and I will say this seriously, I felt like the weight of the business was on my shoulders Mm. and that it was my responsibility to sort everything out. So I think there were, they, they were some of those key beliefs. And I think the fear that potentially drives us is that fear of maybe not being good enough. Yeah. That drives you to do, you know, to want to do more um, and to do your best. It can be very, 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 very dangerous. Yeah. That underlying belief of I'm not good enough is, it's really common. Like, And it's something I've uncovered in my own journey of, you know, I've had therapy um, and it's almost when you have that underlying belief of that I'm not good enough, you then develop damaging habits and behaviours that that are not 
loving and not nurturing to yourself. And I was just thinking of um, when you were saying about when you were like lying on the office floor on your back, it reminded me there's a really good book called The Body Keeps the Score, which was written by uh, somebody called Bessel van der Kolk. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, <laughs> it just reminded me that, you know, our bodies uh, are, are a very good barometer for what's going on in our minds. I don't know if it was related or not, but back in 2010, I actually spent two months in a coma because I got pneumonia. It could be related to my disability because I've got respiratory issues. Um, so I am particularly prone to chest infections and pneumonia and things like that anyway. But looking back at it, actually, I was I, I was working really hard. I was doing a job at the BBC. I was um, I was a chair of a national charity but I was kind of standing in for the chief executive who had resigned as well. And maybe in hindsight, it was it was my own body of saying, you know, enough's enough. You know, you've reached that that burnout level. Talking of the, you know, we've talked about a lot of the, the signs to look up, out for, but if the person listening to us right now is concerned about the well-being or burnout of people within their organisation, what, what are some of the common signs that they should be looking out for? And how does burnout affect execs or, you know, uh, people working in a company? Mm, absolutely. Well, I, I think, you know, changes in behaviour is one of the things to look out for in people. Um, you know, are you noticing an increased or persistent, you know, tension, stress level, anxiety? I think um, uh, difficulty in concentrating, perhaps being more snappy or withdrawn is the other thing I think to watch out for as well. You might find that people um, w withdraw themselves. Um, for me, uh, there was an there was a neglect of, of self care and uh, an over prioritization on the the workload, and I think just this sense of not enjoying things anymore as well. Um, so so yes, and and I guess to you know to answer your questions in terms of the impact that it has is absolutely massive. It's huge. Um, you know, okay, we, we, we've talked about how it can, you know, impact your health. I've alluded to how it was impacting my relationships. It also massively impacted my career as well. And so if I go back to my own example, so after that, after that day, I did seek out help and I did I did speak then at that point in time to my then director to say something needs to change. And the, the thing that we ultimately decided that needed to change was that actually I was going to step down from my post. And that then brings a whole host of other challenges that come along with that. Now, it wasn't immediate and I was able to help plan and structure the team and what that was going to look like going forwards. Uh, but then, you know, to sort of take that step backwards in your career. So it can have these, it can have these, the, you know, the, the, these huge impacts. It can be life changing. It really can. You know, and that's without us getting into the productivity, the performance challenges, you know, that it that it creates on a on a business level. You know, I'm talking very much there about what it does for an individual, but, you know, huge then in terms of uh, for, for a business as well. Yeah. So what are some of the steps that we could take to prevent us getting to the, the stage of burnout? There's a number of things, isn't there? And uh, for me, one of the things as organisations that we can do is just to be mindful that I think typically if you're suffering from something like this or you feel you might be approaching burnout, it's very tempting to see that it's your problem to fix. But actually, I believe that there's a shared responsibility. And yes, although your organisation might support you, I think it's actually this this shared responsibility between the leadership of the organisation creating a positive work environment and work culture that can contribute to positive mental health amongst your workforce. And so, you know, being able to speak out about it, I think is really important. Being able to talk to your leaders about manageable workloads and what that looks like. 
being able to have clear roles and responsibilities. I see that being a big challenge sometimes for things like this communication or lack of, you know, good communication and good communication channels. And I think probably one of the biggest things, and I appreciate that people might not necessarily be able to entirely control this, but is, you know, is the support that we get from, you know, our direct managers, our direct leaders, and where there is a lack of support, that that is massively influential on us as individuals. And if you don't have that support from your leaders, um, or from your, you know, your direct leader, then you know, please seek to find that support elsewhere, whether that's inside or outside of your organization, because none of us do this alone. And I think that's, you know, it's so important to be able to feel as though you have got somebody who, you know, who's got your interests at heart, who cares about you and what you're doing, and that you're able to talk to. So I think you've already touched on this a bit already. But What are you noticing are the kind of the major trends or patterns in the corporate world that are contributing to people's burnout? And how how should organizations be addressing these these challenges? It's these really, you know, unmanageable workloads that people that people are having to try and deal with, complexity, um, lack of clarity. Um, And I think the other thing that um, I just want to recognize as well is that, you know, even our senior leaders are, you know, they are expected to be managing so much. and, And so often we're asking, we're asking leaders at all levels to develop skills of empathy and compassion and kindness to be effective. And although those skills are essential, it's really easy for those leaders to get stuck trying to balance that emotional intelligence and holding employees to a standard of performance as well. It's not that it's wrong to do that. It's absolutely right to do that. But are we equipping leaders at all levels to be able to do that? I know the answer is typically no, we're not. And they don't know. They don't know how to do it. And they don't know how to do it well. Um, You know, and it's interesting, I was reading some stats the other day, and according to Slack, burnout is most significant in middle management. It's on the rise globally, and it's, it's happening most in that middle management tier, where potentially these people haven't been equipped with, you know, the, the knowledge, the skills, the understanding to be able to balance those two things of being able to have that high emotional intelligence, but also be holding employees to a standard of performance. And the other thing that I think comes up as a concern for managers as well is that they potentially think that they've got to be some sort of therapist. And that's not the case at all. I think, you know, let's take that pressure right off now. If you are a manager and if you if you are trying to, you know, support people within your team, then ask the questions and listen and help them get the support that they need. Be the broker for the resources that that individual needs. And remember that just by listening, just by being there and holding space and listening to somebody, that is so enormously helpful. Never underestimate what that can do for somebody. Yeah, I mean, managers developing coaching skills are just one of the best things that you can do. Like, creating that space holding the space for somebody being an active listener and one of the great things about coaching is that as a coach you don't have to do the fixing you 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 enable and you empower your coachee to arrive at their own conclusions their own solutions and um go and seek the support that they need now i i mentioned this at the top of the show about particular burnout amongst diversity inclusion professionals and practitioners. Mm -hmm. What do you see as some of the the practical or proactive things that diversity and inclusion practitioners can do to look after their well-being whilst maintaining their commitment to the work? Well, actually, I think the two go hand in hand. I don't see how you can be fully committed and 
performing well in your work if you aren't looking after yourself from a health perspective. And that's probably been one of the biggest shifts that I've had. And it probably won't be a surprise to learn that my health coaching came after the um, the story <laughs> that I shared that yeah. I shared with you at the beginning of the at the beginning of our conversation today. And you know, I think you've got to sort of you got to ask yourself how important is your health. You've got to decide and for me it's foundational because without our health you've got nothing else and so the number one thing for you to do every day is to take care of you if you want to perform at your best you've got to look after you and so um it it is about you know kind of looking at and 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 people will intuitively know if you are listening to this, you already know. If I'm to ask you, you know, what intuitively do you know that you either need to stop, start or do more of because it's, you know, for your health, for your well-being? People do know this, but what happens is, is we push it back, we push it to one side, we ignore it, we push on. And so, you know, kind of really looking at what those healthy, positive self-care habits are that you can implement on a daily basis. So you are constantly restoring yourself and whether they're around sleep, whether it's around hydration, whether it's around the food and the nutrition that you're getting, is it about movement or daylight or exercise or connection and finding ways to integrate that restoration as part of your daily life so that actually you you know, you you don't necessarily have to be. Oh, I've just got to get to the weekend, you know, to get the to get to get the break. Um, you know that you can, for example, you can say to somebody, "Do you know what we were going to do a Zoom call or a Teams call today? But would you mind if we just take this onto the old fashioned telephone and then let's and we can just do? I, I want to get outside. I want to get some fresh air. I want to do a walk and talk and and do our meeting and our catch up that way." You're getting the connection, you're getting the movement, you're getting the daylight, you're getting the fresh air, and you're you're actually then integrating things that help you restore. And so I think it is about looking at what at things, things like that 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 easily, easily kind of fit into your day. And I, I guess this is where when I'm working with clients one-on-one, it's about looking at you know, the specifics of what works for them, their lifestyle, where they're at. And so there'll be lots of, you know, there's there's so many different solutions, but it's being conscious and taking and taking action, uh, you know, kind of on those on those things so that you can seamlessly build it in. What is one thing that you do now that you think has a really big impact on, on your well-being? The biggest thing that I changed when I started my health coaching, the number one thing I did was I drank more water, Mm. as basic as that sounds. And the habit that I have got into, which serves me so incredibly well, is that I have a big 700 um, milliliter bottle of water. I put it by my bed full um, before I go to sleep at night. And the first thing I do in the morning is I drink that entire thing. Yeah. Brilliant. I love that. I need to drink more water. Uh, I'm aware of that. I, I drink tons of tea. I don't know if that counts. Um, I drink lots of tea. What kind of tea is it, Toby? It's good old like Yorkshire tea. <laughs> Yorkshire tea. I love a cup of Yorkshire tea. I do. So with with things like with things like your teas and coffees, I guess things to be things to be mindful of are the caffeine and there is nothing better than water. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. In terms of hydration and hydrating you. Um, and one of the concepts that I found useful and that my clients have found useful is a concept of crowding out. So if you're really fancying a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, but you suspect that actually you've not hydrated enough, it's not about denying yourself that cup of tea. It's actually have a have a big glass of water first. Same goes as if you want to eat or do something. Like that. Have a great, have a big glass of water. And then if once you've had that glass of water, you 
you still then want the cup of tea, fine, go for it, have the cup of tea. But it's this concept of crowding out to help you build those good habits rather than feeling like, oh, I'm off that or I'm, you know, denying myself that. And that can be that can be helpful. That was the thing that had that made the biggest difference to me um, initially. But then there's been so many things since then as well. So whether that be kind of from a nutrition point of view, I start my morning on a on a smoothie of, you know, it's like a vegetable, um, a vegetable and fruit smoothie. And I love it. And it keeps me sustained for a really long time. Um, so right through right through till lunch, having you know, snacks and things to hand that are healthy. Because again, like, I, you know, go back to when I was disrespecting this stuff and when work was really, really busy, I would grab what I could on the go and it wasn't necessarily the healthiest thing. So carrying around, you know, bags of nuts or, you know, things like that, that you can that you that you can have with you so that if you're not because it's so easy to go for the biscuits that are in the meeting room yeah <laughs> yeah well I'm a vegan and, and I find it really helps me because I'm a lot more conscious about what I eat so if there are biscuits in a meeting room they're not usually vegan and I found that that actually is quite helpful it's it's prevented me from eating lots of rubbish it is easy to have a very unhealthy vegan diet so you know chips are vegan uh, so it's not a fail safe but it it does help it's been really wonderful to to catch up with you again today before we sign off this episode if the person listening to us right now is worried about their own well-being maybe they feel like they're approaching burnout themselves what should they do to to look after themselves and, and avoid avoid getting into that you know difficult situation please talk to somebody sooner rather than later talk to somebody let them know that you think this is serious and that you are you know not coping with where things are have that conversation because from there you can make things better but please don't just try and keep pressing on brilliant well, Rachel, thanks ever so much for, for joining me again today. It's been lovely to catch up with you and no doubt we'll uh, we'll connect again and uh, we'll do another episode because you're, you're full of wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> As are you, Toby. Thank you so much for having me again. It's been wonderful. You're welcome. And thank you for tuning into this episode of the Inclusive Growth Podcast with Rachel and myself. Hopefully you've learned some really interesting strategies or things that you can do to look after your own well-being, how you can spot burnout in your colleagues and the real impact that burnout has within our modern way of working and what you can do to look after yourself to protect your own well-being. Um, and our happiness. So thanks ever so much for tuning into this episode. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode, which will be coming out very soon. Until then, take good care of yourself. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Inclusive Growth Show. For further information and resources from Toby and his team, head on over to our website at milden.co.uk.